Where are all um Hello, and thank you for tuning into McDougal's Medicine with Dr. John and Mary McDougal. I'm their daughter and your host, Heather McDougal. And tonight, just like every night, we're going to get to uh, lots of questions. But first, let's turn off my YouTube. I'm their Um, daughter and your host, Heather McDougal. And tonight, just like every night, we're (laughs) going to get to... Oh, you have this background. Sorry about that. So we've got general questions, but first we're going to hear a few things from Dr. McDougall. Hi, Mom and Dad, Dr. McDougall and Mary. How are you? Well, good. It's been, uh, it's been a busy week. You know, I like to bring you up to date on what has been, what's caught my attention in the past week. You know, I mentioned to a lot of you, I, I read medical journals. That's how I get my fun. Mary reads novels. And <clears throat> so I just wanted to bring up a couple of things that happened this week. And then I want to talk to you a little bit about protein. Uh, there was an article this week. This comes from the Journal of the American Medical Association, Mark 6, 2024. And this is something that I discovered maybe 20, 30 years ago, which was kind of surprising because at that time, the only drugs we had to treat high cholesterol were niacin and Questran, which is a bioassist. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. And we used to, we used to you know, because it lowers triglycerides, lowers cholesterol, the vitamin niacin in high doses. Well, back then, 25 years ago, it reported that there's an increased risk of stroke associated with giving niacin. There is a letter, a letter in JAMA, March 6, 2024, that shows an increased risk of all blood vessel diseases, a higher risk of major heart attacks, death, et cetera, by taking niacin. Don't take niacin to lower your cholesterol. Lower your cholesterol with food. And they also have a nice, uh, nice article about depression and exercise. And we've talked about that too. These are topics we talk about on the five o'clock show. And I'm just showing you that these are ongoing, interesting topics that, you know, I have to address. Well, this a little. Is stuff you've been talking about forever. I mean, I still remember when you would you prescribe nice to people. Yeah. Because there wasn't anything else. And I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But of course, I prescribed a good diet too. And then last week, I mentioned it to you. I go over this chart. It's now up to two pages, two, two pages plus one about the semaglutides, you know, the GLP-1 agonists, you know, uh, Zempic, Wygovi, Zebbound, and- Monjaro. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> these, are the, these are the reptile poisons that are all the rage and terrible things are happening to people. You know, they lose like not much, not as much as well, about the same as we lose in a year. They have to throw up, they're sick, they've got all, all kinds of horrible things are associated with them. Well, let me add to the list. Uh, I told you about this last time. There's an increased risk in bone turnover when you're on these drugs, okay? Now, uh, you know what I wonder hmm. is because, I, you know, we watch these um, news shows and these um, TV um, talk shows where the, the people come on and they're, they're, you know, famous people and they're much thinner than they were before well, some people told me they have an ozempic look like a, yeah they have, they have a, their like face a, looks kind of like a half dead look like they've been poisoned that's <laughs> what they look like they're being poisoned and, and and i just wonder i find myself wondering you know if in a year they're just going to look like they used to look well except they'll be fat yeah, they're only, they're they're only going to lose 30, look like they they're, they're going to lose 37 pounds hit a plateau at 68 weeks and then they'll be so sick. Then they'll be sick and fat, so they'll look quit, sick. And, and then they'll be just well, like they were before. You know, the compliance rate is only somewhere between 27 and 50%. In other words, at the end of the year, somewhere around a quarter to a half of the people are still taking the drug. Otherwise, they've quit. Well, I couldn't stand it. We've got a compliance rate of, of 85% at the end of the year. That's what This is documented. This is from Oregon Health and Science University, a medical school in Portland that studied our patients. Yeah, well, just eighty-five think about, percent of the people follow. Why the food tastes so good? Just think about it, though. Sometime when you eat, um, uh, last week we went out to um, which we hardly ever do. We went out to a vegan restaurant here in Portland. I'm not going to name it, and um, we had some. We ordered, you know, vegan food. It was little on the greasy side. Jeez. And I spent the next day. Uh, next four days. <laughs> to, uh, wait now. She suffered oh. McDougal's revenge, yeah. which is when you oh. eat well and you go out to, you know, a vegan, greasy Chinese dinner, you end up in the bathroom. It was, you know, it was, uh, you know. I'm not going to go into any more details than that. Well, but about what I'm saying is I wouldn't want to feel like that all the time. But you know, I think people if, adapt to it though, Mary. 
they, they get new bowel bacteria. They kind of adjust to this. Really? Oh, they okay. Do, because oh. you remember in the old days, we were able to tolerate breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You're just not used to it. Yeah, but if, oh, I know I'm not used to it, but I, what you're saying is that they get used to the, the nausea and the and well, no, the thumbnail zempic? No, they don't get used to that. No, that's what that I'm ends, saying. That 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 I would hate weeks. that. Yeah. And so I would I would hate feeling like that like I mean what, what we 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 saw someone say that if if her doctor said, her doctor told her that if she vomited more than twice a day then she should let him know. Speaking of vomiting, <laughs> this is the, the JAMA surgery. Like I told you, I read about fourteen journals a week. This is from JAMA surgery or surgery, yeah, JAMA surgery. And it's an original article, March sixth. 2024. You know, the mechanism they described to you for these shots working is they delay gastric emptying. In other words, keep food in your stomach longer. Well, they have that effect on the entire bowel and they paralyze the whole bowel and you can develop life-threatening ileuses. But in the uh, JAMA surgery, March 6, 2024, they have an article, glucagon-like peptide one receptor agonist use and residual gastric content before anesthesia. You'll see what's happening is these people on the Ozempi are going for surgery and they got this big bolus of food in their stomach and they throw up and aspirate the stomach contents. And die. And die, yeah, of course. Uh, well, unfortunately, some die. Awful. All right, I, I, I promised Heather I wouldn't take too long on this. Okay. And I'm not going to, Heather, I'll quit halfway done if I'm not. <laughs> All right, what I want to do is talk to you a little bit about protein because this is probably the most important topic of any this is where the big lies come from. And I've offered you the research. So please read and see whether or not I'm telling you the truth or exaggerating. You know, you, you go any place. The first question is, well, protein. Did you get enough protein? You go on a vegetarian diet, protein. Go on to the grocery store, protein, protein, protein. As if getting enough protein was a problem. And I've mentioned it many times before. There's never been a case of dietary protein deficiency ever reported on a natural diet. Let me go through some of the evidence for you. How did this get started? It got started in the 1800s with nutritionists back in, let me see if I can get this going, my better looking show. Back in the 1800s, there was a guy named Carl Voigt. And he was a, the European expert on nutrition, et cetera, in the world at that time. And he, he had about five friends that kind of went around with him, buddied up and came to the same conclusions. Well, what Carl Voigt did is he made an assumption he assumed that people would naturally choose the right diet for themselves to meet their natural their natural needs. They, they choose innately. And he figured the only people that got to choose innately were those who had money. And so he studied workers. He studied soldiers who had enough money to buy whatever food they wanted. And he found that they chose higher protein foods. That's how they decided what uh, that you needed a high protein diet was based on social bigotry. Rich people, now that's relatively rich, ended up eating more meat. And that's for why, why you have to eat more meat. But they didn't consider the fact that there were millions of vegetarians around the world who ate half as much protein. Or they didn't consider the fact that people who toil in the fields, the workers, the people of color who did the hard work, they ate diets of corn and rice and potatoes, half the amount of protein. And there they were. None of these people had protein deficiency. So we have Carl Voigt to thank for this nonsense. And you can look up the research and you can see that I'm not exaggerating, that that's basically <laughs> how your protein needs were determined by social bigotry. Well, the idea that you're going to innately choose the right food, excuse me, you've seen this before. Do we have an innate desire to choose the right amount of protein, vitamins, minerals, and calcium? I don't think so. What we do is we choose salt and sugar because that's the way we're, we're adapted to eat carbohydrates and, and a little bit of sodium. Anyway, this fellow right there, he, he he's, well, was one of the earliest ones. He, he comes from uh, Denmark. Uh, his name is uh, <clears throat> Mikhail Hinhedi, a very famous researcher. And he, he determined the diet for people in Denmark during World War I. During World War I, they had the British blockade, and so they didn't have much food. So they were on the face of starving to death like people in Germany were starving to death. And what he told the government is, look, the 3 million Danes to avoid starving to death, we need to eat the food the animals were eating, not eating the animals. And so they stopped eating the animals. Well, Mikhail Hennig is also known for doing his experiments where he would feed people for a long time on a single starch. Like Madsen, this is a year after eating potatoes, which are 10% protein, excellent health, strong, healthy, et cetera. 
And then the next hero that counteracted Voight's principles was uh, Russell Henry Chittenden. He was a, a head professor of, at Yale University. He's actually the father of, of, of American biochemistry. Pretty, pretty good stuff, right? He came to the same concern, and that is that maybe our protein requirements are too high and people are getting sick because they're eating all these high proteins, foods, all this meat and dairy and fish and et cetera. So he said that uh, people, it wasn't that, that people innately had the ability to choose the right things. It's just that, you know, you pick people who have the ability to afford to eat the wrong things. And so he started doing experiments. He did an experiment on himself. He was kind of sickly and was swollen and unhappy. And so he decided to do the first experiment on himself. He cut his protein intake in half. So in other words, instead of 80, 90, 100, 160 grams a day, he took in about 40 to 50 grams a day and he got healthier. He felt wonderful. His arthritis went away, all these things he reports and his very famous book, The Nutrition of Man. Every good nutritionist knows this Bible, so to speak. Well, he went and he tested five of the Yale faculty who weren't very active and they felt better on a lower protein intake. Then he tested 13 hospital core engineer uh, workers who were physically active and they got the same results. And then he tested eight Yale athletes and they improved their athletic performance by 35%. So that all happened in the early 1900s and it should have been fixed by now, but it hasn't been. And then we get into the whole amino acid business. Okay, you got enough protein, but it's missing components called amino acids. Well, this man right here proved that to be totally incorrect. Uh, that's uh, uh, William Rose. He's uh, actually wrote uh, wrote 16 of the most important papers in the Journal of Biochemistry, William Rose did. Discovered the last two amino acids. And he put together findings from his experiments that showed how much of each individual amino acid do we need. There are 20 amino acids. We can make 12 of them. Rats can only make 10, but we can make 12 of them. So eight of them we got to get from the food. When you look at what individual foods provide in terms of each individual amino acid, you find that everyone far exceeds any need any human being would require, as long as they got enough food and it was whole food. And that's what this particular chart shows. I published this on page 99 in the book of the McDougal Plan back in 1983. That's a chart I put together for you. Anyway, the- uh, well, they can print this one out too if they wanted to, couldn't they? Yeah, yeah. or they can, they can get the book of the McDougal Plan. All right. <laughs> so it's bigotry that determines your protein needs. Doesn't that just make you mad? You get breast cancer, heart disease, diabetes, constipation, indigestion, because somebody decided based upon bigotry that if you're wealthy enough to afford food to kill you, that you do or you will. Well, I can't understand this. Why, after all this other stuff, I mean, if, if they... Well, it's because Maybe. industry got their dirty fingers in it. Oh, you know, okay. it's uh, all all major universities that I I can look up right now. Uh, you know, uh, 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 Weinberg's school in uh, Chicago and um, Kraft, uh, Yale University. You look at these different universities, and they still promote a diet that requires you to balance your food so you get enough amino acids. And the only one that doesn't do that is the American Heart Association. Why? Because in 2001, I took them on, and you'll read the papers that I wrote in the journal circulation on the fact that it's impossible to design a protein or amino acid deficient diet. All right, so how much protein do we need? Let's look at it from, from a different couple of different points of view. The greatest time of growth in your life is when you're a baby. You've doubled in size the first three to six months of life. The ideal food for a baby, you're not gonna argue with me, I know you're not is yeah. human breast milk. Human breast milk is 5% protein. And you, you double in size. It's got to be ideal. Anyway, uh, other animals, they grow faster. They reach adult heights quite quick, more quickly, and they require higher amounts of protein in their mammalian milk. And that's what this chart on the left shows. But the important thing for you to understand is ideal nutrition at your most, most rapid and demanding time of growth in your life is human breast milk, which is 5% protein. All right, so what do you need protein for? Well, you need it to grow. If you get injured badly, you need to repair the tissues. Yes, you do. But how about other protein needs? You're all done growing. You don't get injured very often. How about your other protein needs? Well, like protein to make tears or to make intestinal cells or to grow hair or to grow skin and replace it. How much do you need? You need about three grams of protein. How much would that be? 
That's about, probably about one, two, three percent protein at most. That's all you need. Okay, so let's just say it's three percent protein. Experiment done, uh, all potato diet, 1928, took a couple who were marathon runners, fed them potatoes only for six months. They got some fat, but that diluted the amount of protein in the potato because there's no, no protein in fat. So they lived on an all potato diet for six months. They were athletes. And a couple of things were described at the end of this paper, which you can look up. I would provide the reference right there in the bowl, lower right-hand corner for you. It's open access. You can read this paper at, at, when you get done listening to me. And what you'll find is they reported a couple of things. They did not tire of a nutrition, uh, of the, they did not tire of the uniform potato diet and there was no craving to change. Isn't that amazing? They only, only potatoes, they, they were just fine. And that even though they were both physically active, they were described as in good health on a diet in which the protein was practically solely derived from potatoes. Okay, okay, let's do oh, another one. I could go on for hours. How about people in Papua New Guinea? This is a population that's lived in the highlands of Guinea for you know tens of thousands of years. Oh, yeah. look at how huge those potatoes are! <laughs> sweet potatoes. Yeah, and sweet potatoes. And and they live uh, it really bother nutritionists. Uh, well, maybe they still bother them. I don't know, but it bothered them tremendously to the point where they decided to study the uh, uh, the Highlanders in New Guinea and find out how they could survive on a diet that was ninety two percent. Sweet potato leaves and roots. It was a diet that was three to three to six percent protein. Well, they fought battles. They had babies. They existed for tens of thousands of years. They grew to adult heights. Yes, they did on sweet potatoes. The last thing you have to worry about is whether you'll get enough protein or not. But protein industries are what drives the market. One more example: cassava. You're told you're told that there's malnourishment in Africa is because they don't have the good old American foods. They don't have enough meat, they don't have enough dairy. Uh, the population of rural Africa, their dominant starch is cassava. Cassava is 3.4% protein. Remember human breast milk is 5%. And it supplies the nutrition for 800 million people. Just, just like rice does in Asia. And potatoes do in South America. The cassava root is not only adequate and at total protein, but in all the essential amino acids. They just don't have enough of it to eat. And when 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 uh, concerned groups go to help the rural Africans starving, their first attempt to help them was to feed them uh, reconstituted dairy. And you know they described how when they got off the airplane, that it was just covered with diarrhea. <laughs> <laughs> the dairy. So they found out you can't feed these high protein, high dairy foods to people recovering from malnutrition. Okay. Look, you, you heard this example. I'll end with this. Heather, I'll, I'll end. <laughs> and that is that, look, the biggest animals with the biggest muscles and the greatest energy needs in the world eat a vegetarian diet. Why couldn't you or shouldn't you? Maybe we'll get into a further discussion about what we'll talk about the damage done to the bones to the kidneys, to the blood vessels, the cancer promoting aspects of believing that you ought to be eating a diet high in protein. But that's what my parents were taught. My parents were taught and they abided by it because they loved their children. They were taught the only nutrients you had to worry about to feed your kids was protein and calcium. And so my parents did, they fed me lots of calcium and protein. I almost died, you know my history. I was sick up until I learned to change my diet in my mid-20s. I wouldn't be talking to you right now if I hadn't figured out that there's no such thing as protein or calcium deficiency. There's such thing as plant food component deficiencies. Like, for example, you know about scurvy from vitamin C, which is only present in plants. You, you know about beriberi, which is due to thiamine, which is only present in plants. You know about uh, pellagra, which is due to uh, tryptophan, uh, problems with, with corn, with refining corn. Um, so anyway, it, it has to do with uh, niacin, which we started, I started talking about in the beginning. I didn't want to confuse you, but <laughs> it's a deficiency in niacin, which is a deficient, which is claimed to be a deficiency of corn, but it's only after you refine the corn. Okay, Heather, I'm done. <laughs> that was fast enough.
That was great. So important though, because everyone thinks that we need more protein. It's not just oh, people man. eating the standard American diet. Even people in the plant-based world are all about getting more protein oh, and yeah. vegan protein powders. And, you know, we just think that we need more, 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 and we don't. And uh, a lot of the people in the vegan community are very, very, very much experts on how much protein cheesecake has <laughs> and vegan ice cream and vegan candy bars. I know you do because you're what I call fat vegans. It's not meant as criticism. It's meant as a reality, a reality check. You're telling people about the importance of not killing animals. You're telling people about the importance of saving the planet. And yet when they look at you, they see an overweight, unhealthy looking person because you buy into these vegan foods rather than a starch-based diet, which is what you're supposed to be eating. You keep the vegans' foods for your birthday. <laughs> a little birthday cake would be okay. Come on, Heather, stop me. <laughs> okay, lots of questions coming in while you were talking. So I'll start from the top. Okay, this one is from Cherish. In March, her vitamin D levels were 31.4. That sounds good. But her doctor says it's too low. What would you recommend? Well, usually the the, the number is uh, 28 or 29 nan nanograms uh, per milliliter, I believe. So the usual values that I'm familiar with are 28, 29, 30. Oh, Mary flunked Mary flunk the vitamin D test one summer after she spent the summer sitting next to our pool. We'd been to Hawaii and Costa Rica that year. Yeah. So she had tons of sunshine. And she came in with a, a, a vitamin D level of like 28. Nonsense. Uh, you have to worry about your vitamin D levels when they get really, really low, like eight. 20, I would consider adequate. Well, well they, she, Heather said 31. I know. I think she's getting misinformation. She's getting information from the supplement industry. For the supplement industry, there's no limit as to how high you should make your vitamin D. Even though you increase the risk of falls and fractures, yes, you do, when you take more than 1,000 international units of D a day. And we're not talking about sunshine. We're talking about pills and, and, and potions. That's what we're talking about, increasing your risk of fractures. So anyway, well, you need sunshine. That's what you need. Hopefully that's adequate to get you up in the range of, say, 20. If you're down, you know, eight level, I, I would, I'd pay attention to it. And one of the first things I think about is whether or not you're chronically sick. Because the result of chronic sickness, chronic inflammation, is that in the process of healing, the body produces a substance that lowers vitamin D levels in the blood. So you have artificially lowered D levels, even if you get plenty of sun. Well, I if like you your, have I chronic like disease. story about the Hawaiian well, surfers who spend hours in the sun every 28 day. 28 hours a week. 28 hours a week. And that, that study, of course, is available for you. You'll find it in the right-hand corner of some slide. Yeah. <laughs> 28 hours a week, most of it on the beach. And half of them flunk the D test. So, you know, I would I would not waste any time on this except to I wouldn't get I wouldn't order vitamin D <laughs> levels on you. I don't, we don't order a routine when you come to our program. I know what you need to do. You need to go and get some sun. If you're dark skin, you need to get more sun. I know what you need to do. You need to take care of your chronic illnesses, your obesity, your diabetes, your heart trouble, your kidney failure. And how do you fix that? You fix that by fixing the food. Does it always work? Yes, it does. <laughs> I'm sorry, folks. I, you know, I, I, I just made. I, maybe I ought to make up more gimmicks for you, but it's really basic. It's potatoes, it's sweet potatoes, it's rice, it's corn, eh, a few fruits and vegetables. That's it. No animals, no oils. You do fine. But when they talk about um, feeding people that are starving, yeah. the basic foods that that I that I hear them talking about even in, in, in the Gaza, the Gaza. Yeah, I just really want to bring up politics, but they they were talking about bringing a barge full full of food. Yeah, it wasn't cheese. And and it wasn't pork chops. They talked and they said it was staples, and what they referred to were um, rice. barley, rice, potatoes, barley, lentils, yeah. and. Uh, was it rice? I, well, I, the, the, it was just basic starches. So you, you, when you watch and the water. news tonight, water. listen to what they have to say about efforts to you know, help the people in that part of the world right now by making sure that they have enough food to eat. They're feeding them the McDougal diet, ladies and gentlemen. 
Yes, they are. They're not worried about protein deficiency or calcium deficiency. They're not even worried about B12 deficiency, but we can talk about that on another night. <laughs> so, you know, wake up, get with the truth. I provided it for you in the right hand corner of the slide. Look it up. Thank you. Next question. This is from Just Eat Plants. They'd like to know what age one finally crosses over into menopause. Uh, well, it uh -huh. depends on what diet you eat. If you eat the Western diet, then you know, average menopause it occurs at age 52. If you are, say, eat the Asian diet, people in China, Japan, et cetera, or you happen to start out in life eating a healthy diet like we recommend, then around age 48. The problem is, is that what this represents is the excessive and prolonged stimulate of your body tissues with powerful hormones. And it happens at both ends of your reproductive life. If you eat the Western diet, you start your reproductive life earlier. You develop breasts and pubic hair and menstrual periods. When your child, you know, eight, nine, 10, six, seven years old, food. Yeah, really, you think about that. On what we, when we heard about that a girl in Ohio oh, yeah, who she, was raped, she was 10 years old. Well, yeah, yeah. And got pregnant. Gosh. That's I because mean, that's well, well, because she ate the Western diet. Otherwise, if she'd eaten the type of kind of food we recommend, she would have been fertile at age 16 when it's time to have a baby, maybe 14, maybe 18. The, the longest or the, or the latest onset of menarche that I found in my search of populations is 18 years old. The girls became women. So anyway, throughout life, you, you start later if you eat a healthy diet. You end earlier throughout your menstrual life. You have... Uh, you have less risk of overstimulation of your breasts, your ovaries, your uterus by these hormones and improper stimulation. And your infertility is increased. You're not as likely to have healthy children. There's no way to win except to fix the problem. It's the food. <laughs> yeah. and, you know, we talk, old thing. We, talk, we talk about this a lot. And, you know, we have a 12-day program going on right now with a... Well, people who are adjusting, it's still, well, it's Sunday. So we started on Friday. We'll give them till Tuesday. And by Tuesday, these these 50 plus people that we have are going to say, I get it. You know, I understand why I'm off the drugs. You know, I'm starting to feel good. I'm seeing my blood sugar and blood pressure go down. No, I can tell them something's happening. It happens Tuesday. Like, it gives five days. Okay, five days. And then what happens is by the time they go home 12 days after starting, is the, on their lips, hopefully, is the statement, this is the best money and time I ever spent because that's the goal of the McDougall staff to let you leave us in, in much better health tremendous, and can control. But if you're misinformed, you don't stand a chance. And what we try and do in this five o'clock session is tell you what I believe to things to be, what, what I see is the truth. You say, well, that's, this is you, McDougall. Well, I think I've earned the right to talk to you. I have, you know, I've been at this. Well, you're, you're not just making this stuff up. You have references for everything. Oh, yeah, I do. I, I read, I'm passionate about the scientific literature. I've, I've eaten this way since 19, 1977. Yeah. I've read somewhere around somewhere between 10 and 20 medical journals a week since then, from cover to cover, at least their titles and abstracts. <laughs> You know, I've taken care of 12,000 people. I've taken care of 6,000 people in a living situation. I know what happens. You should give me a chance. Yeah, uh, I keep trying. I'll be here. I'll be here next Sunday. I'll keep encouraging you. Keep trying. Give your friends a chance. Give give a chance. You, no. you know, you've got, you've got a, a husband or a wife or a child or a parent who just understands that you're suffering needlessly because they've been through the change. And they want to help you, and you'll you get defensive. Try and let your defensiveness down and give them a chance. At least give them four days till next Tuesday. <laughs> okay, next question. This is from Mary. If you had a toothache under a large filling held in with pins and amoxicillin took the pain away, would you still go through with the root canal and crown that the dentist recommended? Out of, my, out of my field. Oh, man, that's a tough Out of one. my field. All, all I know is that uh, 
the dental business has done a really pretty good job with taking care of people. Not so when I was a kid. You know, if I gave you a period into my the teeth I have at age 77 years old, you would say somebody got to you when you were a kid because they didn't just fill cavities. They took off the top of your tooth and put mercury fillings in. So they destroyed an awful lot of teeth, which it sounds like this person had her teeth destroyed. Uh, you don't want an infection under your tooth. So, no, you so, don't. Yeah, you know, antibiotics aren't going to take care of it either. you got to have drainage. You know, that's not going to solve the problem with antibiotics. It may have temporarily taken some of the pressure off of uh, the infection. But yeah, you need intervention. And uh, what you can have done, well, again, I'm not a dentist, so don't offer me any, <laughs> any comments or criticism because... I don't claim to have the expertise on it, but having had enough dental visits and known enough dentists, like I used to talk, I used to talk like to 8,000 dentists at their yeah. conventions, like uh, the Hinman lecture in Georgia and all over the, all over the world. Uh, I, I would, they would be so interested. Dentists would be so interested because, because they know something about nutrition, whereas your medical doctors don't. I mean, dentists at least know that it's not good to eat sugar. They, you know, so they at least teach some proper nutrition, whereas my colleagues have no idea. Most, and right, Heather, I know there are a lot of them that do. But um, anyway, I, you don't want to let this go. There are lots of things that can be done, including a, a crown, a root canal. But well, I would go try and save the tooth. Yeah, I was going to just say that. I'd go in with the attitude, I'm going to do everything to save this puppy. Yeah. <laughs> and then if, if and if and, you, and yeah. just taking an antibiotic to take take away the uh, the infection, I wouldn't think would be enough. No, if you still I, have the drainage problem. Yeah, you still have the, the you still have the accumulation of fluid under the cavity, which gets infected or inflamed or whatever. So yeah, you need to see the dentist. Thank you. Okay, next question. This is from. Bagel Mittishmere, for people with osteoporosis that take a prolia shot every six months and supplement with cal calcium and vitamin D, how does your right. diet provide the calcium and vitamin D that people with osteoporosis need? Okay, well, prolia is a, I believe that's a nasal oc oxytocin hormone that is derived from fish. You could have me wrong. I mean, there's several of them out there. But anyway, um, Look it up. Oh, look at that. Let's see if it's oxytocin. <laughs> I don't prescribe it uh, because of, uh, you know, mainly the lack of effectiveness. But um, where do you get calcium? Well, you get calcium from the ground. What was the other question? Where else do you get, you get calcium? Where do you get bone material? Well, you get it from your the protein for your diet. Oh, so what is it? Stops bone removing cells before they can reach and damage the bone. All right. Well, whatever. Yeah, I don't know what whatever. Whatever. I certainly would encourage you to look into the benefits and risks before you add this to your program. Uh, okay. You need to understand all the research that's been published because I've looked at it. It, on, it says right here, prolia can cause serious side effects. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to think what basically, whether it's bisphosphonate or oxytocin or what. There, like I say, there are a lot of them. And I can't remember everything. Uh, anyway, uh, if you look at all the science, and I've spent like 40 years looking at it, what you find is that the benefits of vitamin D can only be demonstrated in the sickest of people. They can only be demonstrated in elderly white women who are institutionalized, and they're at the greatest risk for fractures. So even though there's a tiny benefit from a vitamin D calcium supplement in this circumstance, you got to be really sick to see it. Okay, the other thing you'll find is that in these combinations, they only worked if you had calcium along with the vitamin D. Vitamin D alone doesn't work. But the combination does. And why does it work? Because the calcium is an antacid, like Tums. It's calcium car carbonate. It's an antacid, and what it does is it neutralizes the dietary acids that you consume in the form of animal foods. And so I treat osteoporosis in this manner. Moderate exercise, don't go out and hurt yourself and break your bones. Adequate sunshine and a diet low in protein and particularly low in animal proteins because they're so acidic. So sunshine, walk around a little bit, eat a healthy diet, 
And if I do believe at all that you ought to correct a vitamin D problem, even though I just told you the research, <laughs> is you take a dose of less than a thousand micro international units, or a thousand, excuse me, I, there are a thousand international units, because above a thousand, and I've got the research, I showed it to you, above a thousand, you increase the risk of falls and fractures because you create nutritional imbalances. Between not adding any supplement and a thousand, there's some research that shows benefits, but again, that's in combination with calcium. So where do you get your calcium and your protein? You get it from the food. You build elephants, giraffes, people. I know it's hard. You better be very careful of these bone building drugs, ladies and gentlemen. The first of all, you'll find out they do very, very little in terms of absolute benefits. And the other thing you'll find is that some of them are quite toxic. So, you know, at least take care of the sunshine and the walking around moderately and the diet first and see whether or not you can build your bones back. You can build your bones back, you know. Now, this is not concrete or cement. This, this is tissue that heals. And we know this because of a couple of observations. One is when you go to space lab for a year and you don't have gravity affecting you, the body gets rid of bone mass, bone material and calcium. Your bone mineral density goes down in this non-gravity situation of being in outer space. When you come back from outer space, they check your bones. And what they find is that you remineralize your bones when you come back to earth and its gravity. Start walking around again? Yeah, that's all you gotta do, start walking around. <laughs> the, other, the other way we know this is if you've ever had a fracture yourself, say in your forearm or your child, and you went to the doctor to put a cast on it. So the fracture didn't move for three months. You know, it didn't, didn't require any strength. It was just setting this cast. And the doctor takes an x-ray just to make sure everything's right. An x-ray of the bone before the cast <laughs> is taken off. And you go, whoa, whoa, these bones look like they're really thin. Are they, doc? Yeah, they are. You've lost bone mass in that right upper extremity because of inactivity. But when you or the child, et cetera, takes the arm off the cast and starts using it, guess what? The calcium and the bone tissue come back. You know, just like if you, you know, the same situation, if you didn't move your arm for three months, you would develop muscular atrophy, okay? What do you think would happen if you took the arm out of the cast and you started doing a little weights? You know that's true. They had their, they had their talk with Jack today, right, about exercise? Oh, yes. All about functional fitness. So, 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 I mean, people... People think that exercise is not important, that you sit around and, and um, I mean, it's, it is important. But you got to be careful. Well, of course. I, I worry about people who get uh, well, they try exercise to do too much. for yeah. pleasure, like ride bikes, bicycles to get hit by cars. And you need to have a safe exercise. So, or, or you ride bicycles and you, you go into a pothole and you fall down. Yeah, and end up under a car, which one of our <laughs> friends did. Oh. oh yeah, or 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 you know, in the days when I windsurfed, <laughs> which I'm not, and I'm sure I'm done yet. But the days when I windsurfed, um, I didn't do it for my health. I'm sure I didn't do it for my health, particularly the first time I fell in the water, <laughs> because I knew I knew that she was down there ready to bite me. But I figured if she didn't bite me the first time. That would great white shark. That I'm probably okay for the rest of the day. <laughs> but I don't do it for good health. I just do it for fun. And you want to kind of make those distinctions because you don't want to end up doing more harm than good to yourself by ex excessive exercise. This March 6, 2024 article I gave you out of JAMA, Journal of the American Medical Association, was talking about depression and exercise. Again, something I've talked to you about is that, you know, a runner's high, you relieve depression. Sunshine relieves depression, seasonal affective disorder. Um, food, eating a low animal protein diet, Release depression. And controlling your sleep is the other way you do it, by not getting too much sleep. Because excessive sleep causes depression. Long way true. <laughs> it's in my March 2004 newsletter, if you want to read it. March 2004, nothing's changed. I object to you saying that I use all research to support my points of view. I'm passionate about reading the journals. And if I found anything that needed uh, correcting on my message in current research, believe me, I'd be the first one to tell you about it because I wouldn't want you to tell me about it. And I wouldn't want my, uh, my um, 
I don't have any enemies, but people who object to what I say to tell me about it. No, I'm, I'm going to find out about it first. I'm that kind of person. Right? The, you know, I was, I'll end it with the, 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 the truth is so strange. You don't have to bring in fiction. It is so bizarre. Just like this protein thing I told you. I mean, can you believe that the science dedicated to how much protein you, you, you should eat is based upon the bigotry of white people? Which, by the way, Carl Hoyt and his friends, they're all white people. <laughs> <laughs> Prejudice, bigotry, good God. And it affects everybody, doesn't it? It hurts everybody, that kind of thinking. Okay, next question. Uh, this is from Carlos. He wants to know how much beta carotene should one be getting to rejuvenate one's eyesight? And should you get it naturally or take a supplement? You should get it naturally. Okay, beta carotene is the vitamin A precursor. Vitamin A is called retinol, and that's the form that is produced in the animal, the bear, the person, et cetera, in their liver when they eat the precursor, which is beta carotene, which is only found in plants. Okay, uh, how much beta carotene do you need? I don't remember. You know, you can look at some type of governmental recommendations. It, it's, it's less than you get in an orange, you know, <laughs> or a slice of orange. It's just, it's an only a tiny amount to get enough vitamin C. Now there are people out there like my old radio guest, Linus Pauling. He was a guest on my radio show. I don't know whether I still have that interview or not. You know, won the Nobel Prize twice. Tried to convince people they should take grams of vitamin C to, to deal with all kinds of serious problems like, like cancer. Well, Linus Pauling died of prostate cancer. You see, that's the problem with being a guru. Is <laughs> I can't die. <laughs> I've, got, I've got to live to be 150 at least. At least. So you'll think that what I taught you was was incorrect. I'll, I'll try. I, I keep trying every day. Yes, you have lots more to teach us. So yeah, well, it, it's it, no heavy, but it comes down to a, a simple message, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't be upset with people if they said, "Well, you know, you're saying the same thing over and over again." Yeah, but I've been telling myself the same thing over and over again for 47 years, and I'm not getting bored. I've been telling you, I mean, tens of thousands of people in lectures, on TV shows, radio shows, millions of people, the same stuff. I was, I've been telling, telling you, I told you for, for 47 years, I never get tired of telling you about it. The topic is so interesting. And to watch people's minds, faces, you see it in their face, light up when they finally see that they're not a victim. You know, they're not trapped into this bad health or this obesity problem. All they got to do is fix the darn food. Starch. <laughs> I know we really don't find anybody objecting to what I have to say. Have you ever noticed that? <laughs> they might not like it, but they, they don't object to it. And you've got people certainly on the opposite side of what I try and teach you. You've got the, the Atkins and the keto and the carnivore diet. You got a guy out there, he's a doctor, he's got a nice body, better than mine. But lifts weights, but of course he's 30 years younger than I am. <laughs> he's out there, he tells you, you gotta eat the carnivore diet. And what he tells you, I believe it or not, this guy's a medical doctor. He tells you you should eat everything in an animal from the tail to the nose, everything. That's pretty bizarre. <laughs> That's pretty bizarre. Look him up, look up the carnivore diet. You'll find this foolish man. You're not going to do it for very long. He'll be like Atkins. He'll die early of heart disease, which Robert Atkins did die of heart disease. And I, and by the way, I, I'm older than, than Dr. <laughs> Atkins. He died at 70, 70 or 71. I'm 77. I'll live that sucker. <laughs> okay, next question. And besides, um, I, look better than he, I, look better, I look better than he did, Heather. I got to add that. Robert Atkins, when... when <laughs> when we found his medical records, which some of my colleagues and I did, we found his medical records, uh, I think it was uh, in Washington is where he was examined. We found out that he was obese when he died. He had horrible arteries. He had high blood pressure. The man was a sick, sick man. Yet he ran around telling everybody that he didn't have heart disease. He was healthy. And uh, he died from heart disease, not from a fall on the ice in April in New York. There wasn't any ice out that day. Yeah, he fell. He he died and then he fell. 
But, you know, what troubles me, and it, you could carry this discussion to the political environment, what, what bothers me is that things can be so obviously true, yet the other, the other side doesn't seem to see it. And know how hard we try to figure out why don't you see this? You know, I've given you, I've given you, you know, the bulk of the scientific literature going back sometimes thousands of years. I, I've given you the reference from, from your religious teaching, your Bible. You know, I, I don't know what else I can do. The results of our our patients are published. How can somebody believe the exact opposite? I'll tell you why. I'll tell you, I think I know why. Is because you do lose weight on the Atkins carnivore or keto diets. You lose weight by going into ketosis, which is a state that you reach when you're sick. So you lose your appetite. So yeah, you do lose weight. And it's easy. I mean, all you have to do is go through the fast food line and scrape off the ketchup and pickles and throw away the bun and you're on the Atkins diet. Uh, do you feel better? No. And, and, and it, does it help all the other things? I mean... Well, I published an article that really changed things. It's actually the basis for... Dr. Michael Greger's initial attempts to straighten the, the world out in terms of truth. In 2004, you can look at it up in my newsletters. You'll see an article I wrote about the Atkins research. And I explained 70% of the people are constipated. 60% 60 or plus compared of, of halitosis. Uh, they have more heart disease. Their bad cholesterols go out. Anyway, um, I, I don't know. I, I guess, <laughs> I guess... People, it's hard to get people to change, no matter how how, how dumb the trouble they're in. We've but been trying for years. 40, 47, 48 years now we've been working at this. But Mary, once in a while we catch one. Well, once in a while we once do. Once in a while. And, and we're, that's why we're so excited about the program. Because, you know, once you get somebody's mind open, then they're left with, well, what do I do? And when you finish the 12 days, oh, you don't have any doubt about why you got into trouble, what medications you you need or will do you more good than harm and what your future is going to be like, you know, what you can fix and what you can't fix and how you do it. That's, that is the educational tool you will get in 12 days and you'll see it. You don't have to believe us. You'll see it in your response to in your body. Okay. You don't want to come to our 12 day telemedicine internet program where we have the best staff in the world to help you. That's okay. Everything's free on the website. An entire 12 day program with recipes, everything's there, nothing's held back. Of course, you gotta put a little work into it. You don't get the advantage of our of our experts, our uh, psychologists, our dietitian, our exercise, uh, Jack Dixon, specialist, you know, Heather, Mary, myself, and you know, we all we got quite a team. In order to make the transition painless for you and permanent. Permanent. Remember, remember what I told you. In our research done at Oregon Health and Science University, 85% of the people were still following the diet after one introduction to the McDougal program. They came to our 10-day resident uh, resort-based program in Santa Rosa. That's all the education they got. I, I didn't even give them any lectures during the during the year. They just they just received the material that you get in the 12-day program now over the internet. And they went out on their own, and 85% of them were still following the diet at the end of the year. In other words, they permanently changed because the results are so phenomenal. You doubt me? <laughs> Give me 12 days. You won't be disappointed. You may still find it a little difficult, and we're going to kind of iron that out for you during, during our five, five o'clock sessions on Saturday. Sunday. Sunday. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> People are going to have doubts about my Oh, no, Really? Yeah. Maybe you should just pass me notes so that you know, you're correcting me all the time. Yeah, I've always been this way, folks. I'm, this is nothing new. You guys make a good team. <laughs> okay, this next question is from Nancy. She is writing in wondering, how do I help my cardiologist agree that I don't need Entresto anymore as my echo tests have been great for some time now? Well, you're you're the customer, aren't you? What I would do is I would go in and I'd ask the doctor to provide research that supports continued benefits. You say your ejection fracture is normal. That indicates to me that you really didn't have as much heart damage as you once thought. So your ejection fraction is normal, which is 65% of the blood. Each time the heart beats, it pumps out 65% of the blood. All right? That's normal. 
you get into trouble when you're less than 50%. And you're in big trouble when you've lost 90% of your heart muscle. But you can survive on 10, 12, 15%. Uh, this drug is supposed to help with people who have lost a lot of heart muscle. And it's, you know, it's a drug that's come out uh, past my educational career. I've, I don't see patients often that have these problems. But I'll tell you how I suggest you handle it the way I would handle it if you happen to become involved with me. In other words, if you came to the 12-day program and asked this question, I would uh, provide for you the research, as I saw it, that you need to talk to your doctor about. And you need to sit down and go over it. Look, doc, this says this. Am I interpreting this correctly? Okay. You know, Dr. McDougall gave me a, the point of view that I should stop this medication for heart failure. Now, it's your job as the recommender who I just paid $500 to, to provide for me the research and evidence that this will do me more good than harm. You're owed that. You're the customer. And if you, when you get done with this discussion, if you don't feel that that the balance is in terms of doing you more good than harm. Don't do it. Go go see another specialist. That's what right. I do first. You know, make sure you've got all the information from myself or from your original cardiologist. And you know, one of the things that's kind of, that works really good when you go see a second opinion is don't, first of all, don't get a referral from the first opinion. If you ask your cardiologist, can you recommend a second opinion? What do you think he or she's going to do? She's going to send you, he's going to send you to a cardiologist who agrees with their point of view. So you don't start out the conversation that way. What you do is you find out who are the reputable cardiologists in town. You go in with rather a naive approach in the sense that you just hand them the pile of drugs you're on in your history and you say, look, what do you think? I don't want to hear what the, the past doctor thought. I already heard about what he thought. What do you think? You're paying him. You're hiring this person. Anyway, and then when you come away from it, after all, you're the one that ultimately receives the benefits and the harms. The doctor is not going to, he or she, it's not going to ruin their day if you drop dead of heart disease. Probably not. Who's Who's going to benefit or uh, or be harmed by this these decisions being made. It's you. You need to be involved. It's your family. You need your family involved. These are big decisions. And I can tell you, in general, less is more. In other words, if you have a decision to make to treat aggressively, to test aggressively or not, you're better off or not. Less is more in almost every situation I can think of. So just buy those things that work. <laughs> Thank you. There's some discussion going on in the chat about how things change when you've had your gallbladder removed. Can we talk about that? <laughs> yeah, I'd like to talk. Remind me to talk about that, but I, I forgot to tell people something. Is uh, Two days ago, the New York Times had an article about the new uh, uh, Alzheimer's drugs, the Laquimbi. And uh, so I wrote a letter to the editor to the New York Times this morning. And I, I put that in the chat, or Heather's going to put it in the chat. You might be interested in it. I, I tried to uh, point out something we've talked about. It's fine. I'm sorry to repeat myself. That these new drugs that they're using are called uh, monoclonal antibodies. And uh, they destroy the, the, the architecture of the cells that have that have that are diseased with Alzheimer's. And uh, the problem is several. One is that the benefits over a year period of time are a two years, two year period of time are a 27% improvement. Using another treatment, which I talked to you about in the article that Heather's going to put in the chat, which I sent to New York Times this morning, using deferoxamine, which is non-toxic, virtually free, uh, cures the problem because it removes aluminum from the system results in, at the end of the study, those who got the deferoxamine were twice as functional, twice as mobile as those who didn't. You compare that to the 27% improvement using these drugs that cost between 26 and $52,000. Why, why are we studying deferoxamine? It's been around since the 1980s. I'll tell you why. You know why. 
the cost well, of the, the whole article in the New York Times was about how scientists are are rebelling against the FDA making approving these drugs because they know they're so useless and toxic. Twenty percent of the people treated with these drugs end up with brain swelling and bleeding, and they have to stop the drugs. De Deferoxamine at most gives you a little needle pick, at most. <laughs> Anyway, there's a whole lecture that I've given on that, which I'm sure is need to be repeated. But that, there's another, there's an article for you. And remember, you can add to the GLP-1 chart, you can add aspiration from retained <laughs> stomach contents. So you don't want to go to surgery and you're on these drugs and bone loss and muscle loss and sex drive loss. That one bothers me a lot, even though I'm getting older, Mary. <laughs> now you got to talk about the gallbladder. Oh, yeah, the gallbladder. Uh, when you lose your gallbladder, you lose the storage sac. You see, you 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 filter the blood in the liver. If the liver makes bile acids. The purpose of bile acids is to digest fat. So what happens is between meals, uh, the common bile duct closes down and the bile backs up into this sac, the balloon, the gallbladder, and it's stored there between meals. And then when you eat fat, we assume you're going to eat, when you eat, what happens is the gallbladder contracts and a little sphincter named OD, ODI, he relaxes. And then you squirt onto the food, the bile acids. Okay, the problem with having your gallbladder removed is you got no sac, you got no balloon, you got no <laughs> gallbladder, you got no place to store this bile between meals. And so it constantly drips out of the liver into your small intestine. It doesn't get diverted between meals into a storage sac gallbladder. And what happens to these bile acids, they're acids. They're irritating. Is they make their way down to the large intestine and they irritate the large intestine and cause horrible diarrhea. One of the most common side effects of having your gallbladder removed is diarrhea. But half the people still are in distress. Just indigestion, you know, other difficulties. And they're not happy. Why? They haven't fixed the problem. The problem is what you put in the intestine. I didn't mention that. <laughs> And then, and then most of them get better. And you stop the diarrhea too. But a low-fat diet stops the diarrhea in 48 hours. You want to know where to find this research? Well, I don't know. Well, I guess we need to. We're going to give a talk pretty soon on the GI track, aren't we, Heather? April we sure are. Yeah. If you want to attend that talk, go to our website. Uh, I'm going to give a, a two-hour lecture on the GI track from the lips to the other end. Everything in between. <laughs> and it's all going to make it's all going to make so much sense to you. Uh, so I hope you can attend that lecture. So one more question about the gallbladder: Does it affect if you don't have it? Are um, nutrient and vitamin absorption affected? No, but what is affected is your risk of getting right-sided colon cancer. Okay, in other words, the the right side of the colon, which is you know on the right side, okay where your right hand is, <laughs> right right sided colon cancer, the large intestine starts there. So that's where there's a lot of bile acid dumped if you don't have a gallbladder. So because of the irritation of the bile acid, particularly in the right side of the colon, the beginning of the colon, you have a higher risk of cancer of the colon on the right side. So you have a higher risk of cancer. How do you fix that? Same way you fix the diarrhea, which goes away in 24 to 72 <laughs> hours. Eat a very low fat diet. You stop the bile acid production or excessive production because bile acids are there to digest fat. So when you take the fat out of the food, the production of bile acids is dramatically decreased. When you eat have the high fiber that's present in plants, the fiber, these materials in the plant, grab a hold of the bile acids and deactivate them. It's all so simple. <laughs> it, it, it really is. You know, the hard part, and that's why we titled our first book that Mary and I ever put together in 1978. We titled it Making the Change. Because the hard part is to try and get you to understand and practice this. It's not, it wasn't called Heal and Stay Healthy or uh, America Diet will Kill You. It was <laughs> making the change because that's the problem. It always works. But how do we help you? I mean, we've, done, we've done so many things to try and help. And the best effort we've made is the telemedicine internet approach. And, uh, and I think our five o'clock attendance proves this. You know, we have uh, more than quadrupled our attendance since we started. 
on this five o'clock session. Tell your friends, you know, just come and meet John and Mary McDougal. You know, they, they can't get to you. There's a whole computer screen separating you. <laughs> They're doing you harm. Anyway, well, we'll see you next Sunday. That was great. Thank you all for tuning yeah. in. Thanks, Mom and Dad, Dr. McDougal and Mary. Uh, yeah, yeah, we are in the middle of a 12-day course now, but our next one starts May 10th, and you can start your medical care right away. So we will see yeah, you all next Sunday at 5 p.m. Pacific. I'm sorry, what was that? I just say they need to get signed up soon because we seem to fill up, fill up pretty quick. We do. So That was a great hour. We'll Thanks for spending time with us. <laughs>